another two. Mon ane bon kuram, that's who I am. I shall arise and now shine for the glory, for the glory of the Lord. Beyond the north, beyond the north, yeah. beyond my feet, beyond the natural, I will still. I shall arise beyond the sky by the power, by the power of the Lord. Beyond the limits, beyond the limits, sing it. Beyond the north. Yeah. Beyond the ordinary, we overcome. He's got before us. Who can stand against us? Stand against us. We have the victory. To Christ alone. Come on. I am blessed. You know the team. Might be broken, but I'm here. Still alive. Still alive. Come on. Satisfied. Yeah. Beyond the north, sing it. Beyond my feet, yeah, yeah. Beyond the natural, come on. I would have told, yeah. I'm sorry, high. Beyond the sky, by the power of the Lord. Beyond, beyond the limits, beyond the north, yeah. Beyond the ordinary, we overcome. We overcome. If God is for us, who can be? We can stand against come on, who can be against? Us. We are the victory. To Christ alone. Beyond, beyond. Beyond the limit. Sing it. Beyond the love. Come on. Beyond the ordinary. Yeah. We overcome. Push it, push it. Come on. Yeah. We can stand against us. Yeah. We are the victory. To Christ alone. Now let's do this greater. Greater is he that is in me. to another edition of the Spoken Word. My name is Pastor Bernard from the Powerhouse Ministries International. Last week, we re-examined some foundational and fundamental disciplines and practices of a faith for every true and faithful disciple. How to study your Bible, for example. How to pray. The importance of fellowshipping. How to hear the voice of God. And how to preach the gospel. With the proliferation of many church denominations and false prophets and apostles, Many people are bombarded with all sorts of information and interpretations which are not in conformity with God's nature, his character, and his ways. The reliance on personal prophecies and books by so-called men of God 
seem to have replaced the Bible in many pulpits and deepened the crisis and woes of many Christians who unfortunately do not read the Bible. It has therefore become very necessary to re-emphasize the call for personal Bible study. And today I continue with our key verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study is not fun, but it is intense work that prepares you for a future and must be taken seriously. The quality of your study will therefore determine the quality of your future life. Last week, we started with how to study. Today, we shall continue with rightly dividing the word of truth. This suggests that the same word of God can be wrongly divided or wrongly interpreted and applied. And so we shall seek to provide a few guidelines to help the right interpretation and application of the word. The call to all disciples starts with the word study and implies more than just a cursory glance and general reading for information, but a very diligent acquisition of knowledge that solves problems and improves the quality of life. In this case, it clearly suggests an ability to contend and gain mastery in the knowledge of God and in his word, as distinct from other practices of man and of evil. A clear example to illustrate are the miracles Moses performed before Pharaoh together with the magicians of Egypt. Performing a miracle per se is not necessarily a sign of the presence or approval of God. Both are miracles, but how does one distinguish between that which is of God and that which is not of God? And this is one reason why it is important to study, to know which acts are in sync with God's character and God's ways. So we start with a basic guide, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. What does it say? We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star ariseth in your heart. Note the words, until the day dawn. Verse 20, knowing this, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. It means that you cannot own privately what the scripture says. Allow what you say to be subjected to public scrutiny and discussions. You cannot claim possession of a private revelation for which only you and no one else understands and therefore you impose that private interpretation on other lives. In verse 19, it talks about the light that shines until the dawn of the day. It's a progressive revelation, not a forced teaching or imposition. The word of God provides light and shines dispelling ignorance or lack of knowledge and will eventually fill your heart with the light of God's word. It is not a force against your will for you to accept it's not a brainwashing exercise. It is not an indoctrination against your will. Whoever is supposedly bringing that revelation must be patient enough to explain it and subject it to public discussion and scrutiny. We need to challenge our thinking to align with scripture in the era of many charismatic preachers who have very little or no foundation in theological training and who purport to be inspired, especially when they are teachings are inconsistent with God's nature and his character and his ways. In verse 21, it says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So what we recognize in this is that man did not originate scripture, even though the channels were men. But look at the qualification, holy men. Note the character qualifying the channels used, holy. And yet, our faith is not and will not be in the channels, but will always be in God. And so be careful of those who direct attention to themselves and are unholy. Truly, as we share the word of God, we must decrease and he, Jesus Christ, must increase. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says that all scripture is inspired by God. When you believe the word of God, we are not believing Moses. We are not believing David. We are not believing Abraham. We're not believing in Paul, but the source who breathed into them. All scripture is inspired by God. So the authority that our faith must be anchored into is God, not the vessels. 
they were channels that were used, but the ultimate is God himself. We come back to our main scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible was written over a period of 1,600 years by 40 authors who lived separately and at different epochs of time. And therefore, we need to understand the time in which the words were spoken, the culture, the practices, and the language used to guide our interpretation. The principles are eternal, but the practices may differ from a purely agrarian economy into a more industrialized environment. So we study to interpret. The word study means be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to approach the Bible as a book of divine wisdom. And therefore, I want to suggest a few things. Number one is to submit to its authority. Place it above your own background and your educational levels and your worldview. The Bible is above you. Secondly, approach the Bible prayerfully. Every word is spirit-breathed and came by inspiration. And so, in humility, we ask God to open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of the law. Ask the Holy Ghost to help you. Open your heart to be taught by the Holy Ghost and help you to understand. Do this prayerfully, respectfully, and humbly. May the Lord open our eyes to behold wondrous things in his word, to see the glory and the wondrous things that have been hidden from a lot of people, the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints. May we begin to understand it. Number three, apply yourself to diligent study. Remember, one verse does not form a doctrine, and therefore you must read large volumes of scripture. Apply yourself to meticulous study. We are far removed from a lot of the events of the last writers. Historically, in our language, in our cultural and geographical differences. So even though daily devotions are inspirational, like Peter walking on water may inspire you to press on to overcome your challenges. But we need to study to understand and know the undergirding revelation of how God sees life and how we must also see life. We do not take Peter walking on water as an example and therefore also go and walk on water. Number four, study and allow the scriptures to speak to you instead of forcing your meaning into the scripture. Do not come into the study of the word with a preconceived mind before searching the scriptures, else you will fall into the trap of negative doctrines and letting the gospel say what you want it to say rather than letting it be God's word. Look for what I call the running truth. This theme or this truth will run throughout the Bible and not be isolated. Scripture will always confirm scripture. So in interpreting and rightly dividing the word of truth, a few questions we need to ask ourselves. Number one, what did it mean for the writer and what was his intention? What did he want to convey? Ultimately, the scripture is given by God, but through human channels and how they understood these words. Secondly, what did the passage mean to the first people who heard it or read it? Remember that we are the extended audience. There's a big gap between them and now. Both culturally, with the language forms, with the historical backgrounds, we need to be able to understand what it meant to them and be able to glean the principles and apply it to ourselves now. Number three, what should the passage mean to me today? When the Bible says that Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, or when an instruction is given to Moses to remove his sandals, should it be taken literally and applied, or do we look at the bigger principle it teaches? For today, let me just conclude with this generally accepted theological position, a system for interpreting and rightly dividing the word of truth. And I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. It says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Paul is exhorting us, let every man be careful and take heed. It means pay close attention to the foundation that has been laid and how you build thereupon. For there is only one foundation 
and no man can lay that foundation. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 also confirms this verse. When he says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. There is a foundation. And the most important basis of interpretation is the life and works of Jesus Christ. The life and the works of Jesus Christ are our first and foundational blocks of interpreting scripture. Secondly, the teachings of the apostles of Jesus in the New Testament from the book of Acts to Revelation form the basis of Christian doctrine. Then we come to the law, the first five books of the Bible. Before the New Testament and before the Mosaic law, we had the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then we can also look at the writings of the major and the minor prophets. And then the fifthly, the writing of history. The book of Joshua, Judges, Ezra, Nehemiah, Ruth, Samuel, Chronicles, Kings, Esther, Isaiah. And then the wisdom books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastics, and the Songs of Solomon. What did Jesus say about the behavior in some of these books? Jesus Christ is the last word to measure every experience in the Bible. So, for example, we can read an account of Elisha the prophet mishandling his power and allowing bears to kill people. That cannot be a doctrine. It is in teaching and studying that we know God's ways and find things that are consistent with his character and differentiate it from the practices of human beings on vessels that were used in the Bible. Elisha and Elijah are not Jesus Christ. The foundation of our interpretation is Jesus Christ, his life and his works, and not Elijah or Elisha. I've heard a lot of people talk about David committing adultery, and so it's accepted, or Solomon marrying a lot of people. We are not following Solomon. We are not following David. We are not following Abraham. The foundation for judging scripture is in the life and in the works of Jesus Christ. So even though this may be recorded in scripture, it is totally inconsistent with the nature of God and therefore allows us to see the excesses of man as imperfect, even though they may be vessels of God through whom the Holy Ghost spoke to us. And therefore, it is not an example to practice and to teach others. May we be guided by the Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth, as we study his word. I'm going to continue this study teaching next week as we look clearly at the help and the guidance of the Holy Ghost in teaching us the word of God. Remember, our foundation is Jesus Christ. I pray for you that you shall be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing and please him in every single way. You shall be fruitful in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God. Shalom, peace, and life to you. God bless you.